talking about a universal experience. All of you will have this experience. And it's going to take a majority of your life to do it. Some of you have some raised eyebrows. That's good. Tonight we're talking about hard work. And what does it mean to have a biblical outlook on our work and have a biblical work ethic? Uh, some of you might know, but there are a lot of songs about work. There's uh, 9 to 5 by Dolly Parton. Some of you may be familiar. Yes, the queen herself, Dolly Parton, 9 to 5. It's a great song. For those of you who don't know, it's also in Trolls 3. So my daughters have been introduced to it. Yeah, yeah. That's good. There's a, It's a Hard Day's Night by the Beatles. Any of you familiar? Oh, you don't know the Beatles? Oh, Iffy, some? Bachman Turner Overdrive? No, none of you have heard? Oh, you guys, you're killing me. Taking care of business? I get up every morning for the alarm clocks, want to take the 8.15 into the city. No, nothing? No one? I mean, even Disney has given us the classic work by the Seven Dwarves that we should be whistling while we work, right? No one, nothing. Okay, so you're just going to let me embarrass myself in front of you. Great. So tonight, we're going to be talking about hard work. But there's one thing all of these have in common. It's kind of sad, actually. What they all have in common is this idea that work is itself the curse. And that's not true. See, all the way back in Genesis 2.15, it says this, the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Solomon's going to pick up this theme multiple times throughout the book of Proverbs. The idea of hard work versus the lazy or the slackard. He says in Proverbs 10, uh, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. So you get this idea all throughout Proverbs of comparing the lazy to the wicked, but the hard worker to the one who's righteous. Right? In Proverbs 16.3, it says, Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Jesus picks up this theme in the Sermon on the Mount. Are you all familiar with what Jesus says? Someone throw it out there. What do you think is the New Testament parallel to this verse? You don't have to know the verse off the top of your head, but what did, what did Jesus say? Seek first His kingdom, and all of these things will be added unto you. And that's in the context of Jesus saying, hey, you look at the birds in the air. Does, does God take care of them? Yeah. Well, they don't have to work for their food. You see the flowers of the field? Are they not dressed better than Solomon in all of his splendor? Does God take care of them? And the answer is obviously yes. He's like, well, they don't, they don't have to work. They neither spin nor toil, but God takes care of them. And are you not more valuable than they? Again, the obvious answer to the rhetorical question is what? Yes. You are much more valuable than flowers. You are much more valuable than even birds, even though PETA might disagree with that assessment. I would, from a biblical standpoint, disagree with PETA. For those of you who don't know what PETA is, it's the prevention of... Um, I don't even know. Prevention of abuse for animals. But they take it way too far. That's not the point of tonight. The point of tonight is work and the fact that Jesus takes care of us when we seek his kingdom. All right? Proverbs 22, 29 says this. I've brought this up before. Uh, you may not remember it. It's one of my favorite Proverbs. And it's something that I would use with my students even when I was teaching. I just didn't tell them that it came from the Bible. It says, do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. I have said that the book of Proverbs is not a book of promises, but it's more like bumpers in a bowling alley, right? It doesn't promise that you'll get a strike, but it, more than likely you're not going to get it in the gutter. This one I've seen play out time and time again, regardless of if you are a Christian or not, 
This is more like a promise than bumpers. You see a man skillful in his work, a chef that is very skilled at putting heat to things and putting seasoning on things, can stand before kings. You see guys that are very skilled at pouring concrete and making it look pretty, doing it for the wealthiest of clients. You, if you get really good at painting walls, you'll stand before kings. You will not stand before obscure men. It doesn't matter what your skill level is. If you're working to the best of your abilities, your skill will increase over time. This is a promise, I believe, to us, that if we are diligent in our work, if we are hard in our work, we will stand before kings. We will not stand before obscure men. But we need to have a biblical understanding of work. I need you to hear me before I get too deeply into this. This is not a lesson tonight on this idea that we need to be perfectionists. God never calls us to that because we can't be. Sometimes we're going to do the best that we can and it'll still fall short. Maybe we don't meet the goal. Maybe we don't hit the deadline. Maybe the numbers aren't as good as we hope them to be. But if we've done the best that we can, is God still going to take care of us? Yes. So don't hear this message tonight and take away that I need to be perfect in all that I do. And don't take away tonight that I need to be comparing myself to other people. You need to compare yourself to yourself. And ask yourself the question, am I viewing work, am I doing the work that God's given me to do, biblically, to the glory of Jesus? Some of you may be saying, I don't have a job. To which I would say, yes, you do. It's called school. And I know you're going to not like me for that, but it's true. Your school is what's going to show you what your career might be in the future. It exposes you to different topics, different subjects, that hopefully you grasp onto one that gives you a paycheck by the time you're out. That's not the only answer. There is also trade crafts, plumbing, electrical work, welding, AC. The Bible is clear, as long as you are working, no matter what your job is, no matter if it's school, if it's for money in the future, we should have a biblical understanding of it. My first point tonight, you may not have thought about it this way, but your work is an act of worship. And I can prove it to you. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth about this idea of uh, food sacrifice to idols. And they're going, man, we can't really eat this food because it's sacrificed to idols, so it would, it would be like worshiping a false god. And Paul is going, it doesn't matter. Really, he boils it down at the end of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It says, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, you do it for the glory of the Lord. See, we like to think of worship as the time when people get up on a stage and sing to us. See, that's funny because many of us don't necessarily get involved in the act of worship. Abby can detest to that fact. Fair? Yeah. Uh, for those of you who might not like to sing, uh, we're actually commanded to. So, hate to break it to you. David in Psalms multiple times talks about the fact that we need to lift up holy hands to the Lord. So it's more than just a charismatic act that you see in some uh, more liberal churches. God actually commands us to do so. He commands us to sing praises to Him. So you may be thinking, oh, I don't sing well. Oh, I don't, whatever. My voice isn't that great. Get closer to the speaker and let it drown you out. But your mouth, what comes out of it, is an act of worship, and your work ethic is an act of worship. What you're doing in school what you do at home with your chores. When you view it as an act of worship, it's something that can actually bring you more joy as you're doing it. Now, I can't say that I've always been the best in this. 
There was a period in junior high when I was in seventh grade that my dad affectionately refers to as the time that he almost killed me. True story. It's great. Good times. We still talk about it today. I was taking a history class, and I realized at the end of the year, I had done the math, that in order to get an A in the class, I would need to get like a 94 or a 96 on the final. I was like, man, that's going to be a lot of hard work, a lot of studying, and honestly, I just don't want to do it. So then I did the math on what it would take to get a B in the class. And the answer to that was I could pretty much just put my name on the paper and get like a 13. It's like, if I answer like four right, then I'm getting to be in this class. I really don't have to worry about it. Sweet. I am not going to study at all, and I'm just going to coast right on by. My dad found out about that little plan of mine. Not entirely sure how, but considering I was stupid enough to come up with it in the first place, I was probably dumb enough not to hide it that well. And he corrected me in the best way. It was mostly I was grounded for a long time. But I learned from that experience that hard work is worth it. Might not be fun, might not be the best outcome in the future. I think I did end up with a B, but I could at least hold my head up high at the end of it and say that I was working with all of my effort. And not only is it an act of worship, at that point, it's also being obedient to your parents, which is another commandment that we're given. Darn those commandments, if it weren't for that, life would be so much easier, right? Your work is an act of worship. I don't care what you do later on in life. You can be an engineer, you can be a dancer, a singer, an author, work in the trades, whatever it is, it's an act of worship. It's an act of worship that God gives us for him. Another thing work is, is work is actually restoration. Work is restoring the world around you. Going back to Genesis 2, if you notice what God said, he said that he put man in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Some translations say to cultivate it. You guys know what it means to cultivate an environment, right? What's it mean? Somebody, throw it out there. To make it grow. To create an environment in which things can thrive. Jesus will put it this way, that we're involved in building His kingdom. That wherever you go, whatever you're doing, you're making things right. You're cleaning things up. You see problems and you solve them. I'm not an expert in this, but in physics, there's this idea of entropy. You all are familiar, right? That entropy only ever increases. Entropy is this idea that as you're moving, you're causing molecules in the air to be bumped and to move as well, and it's constantly causing this ever-growing wave of chaos and heat around you. So that entropy can never decrease right? As I move a paper that's moving air molecules and things are causing chaos in my environment. I would say from a biblical, did I get that right? Relatively speaking, those of you in physics. Yep. Thank you. It's been a while since I've thought of entropy, but I think for this example, it helps. We are reversing entropy. You are entering chaos and creating order because that's what Jesus did for us. When Jesus enters your life, it is chaotic, and he brings peace and order. And that's what he's calling you to as well. That's what he's calling me to. That's why he says, seek first his kingdom, because wherever you go, whatever you're doing, whatever your work is, you should be cultivating that. Creating an environment that's good, and peaceful and full of rest because that's what Jesus does for us. It's what He does in our hearts. It's what He does in our minds. It's what He does in our families, our environments. So we've got to ask ourselves, are we a people of restoration? 
Is the work that I'm doing, no matter what it is, am I restoring things or am I adding to the chaos? Am I adding to the entropy around me? And my final point, which I kind of touched on, is work is a reflection. Work is a reflection of whose you are. If you're constantly going into environments and causing chaos, there's somebody else who does that too. His name is Satan. If you're going into your environment and bringing peace and restoration and building and establishing God's garden or His kingdom, you are reflecting His Son. Sinclair Ferguson put it this way. He said, Man was made to work because the God who made him was a working God. Sinclair Ferguson is a Scottish pastor, for those of you who may not know, and he put this better than I ever could. Our God is a working God that did not need to take the seventh day to rest. He's not weak like we grow weak. He needs no sleep like we need sleep. He is constantly at work in your life and in my life. If you notice... All the way back in Genesis, he says, evening and morning, a new day. That while we sleep, God is at work overnight, preparing your day for you. That Ephesians 2 says we were created to do good works. I don't know what it is that God has called you to do for work, but you have a purpose. You have a meaning. You have a specific mission that no one else on this planet has that only you can fulfill. And when you find what that is, you reflect Christ in your environment. Colossians uh, 3 says that our work ultimately is to whom? Our work is to God. Your work isn't to a boss. Your work isn't to Ted, who's 23 and barely knows how to run the fryer. Right? Your work isn't going to be to Claire. No, I'm sorry, not Claire. Um, Susie. There are no Susies in here, right? Your work is not going to be to Susie, who's 47 and doesn't like you and is trying to torpedo your career. Your work's not going to be to the CEO, whatever it may be. Your work ultimately is going to be to God. Whatever you do, do it for His glory. Because you're working for Him. Why? Ultimately, so that we can receive a prize, a reward. There's no worker that works and doesn't expect payment for it, right? At the very least you're reflecting Jesus. At most, you get to be with him and see him more clearly than anyone else. As you're working, and you're reflecting Christ as well, hopefully the people in your environment see you and they ask, why is it you work so hard? Why is it you come to this job that I hate, but for some reason you have joy? Why is it that you keep showing up with a smile on your face when I know things going on in your life might not be the best? To which that opens up gospel conversations of, well, ultimately I'm not working for Ted. Jesus is in my life and he's changed my life. Those are the gospel conversations that come naturally. And if you don't think they happen, they really do. Some of you may have experienced it in school. And if you haven't, look around for the people who do experience joy and ask them. Why is it you're the way you are? Why is it you have peace and joy? See what they say. Maybe it is they just love that subject. Maybe you found another believer in Christ. Going back to Proverbs 22, I said that it was a promise 
when Solomon says, you see a man skilled in his work, he will stand before kings, he will not stand before obscure men. How do I know that's a promise? Easy. One day, we will all stand before the king of kings. We're going to give an account on that day of all the things God has given us and what we did with them. With our time, our energy, our brain, our body, our skills, or lack thereof. And when we stand before Christ, we will receive a reward based off of what we have done or what we have left undone. I pray for each and every one in this room that when we stand before Christ, we can hold our heads up high and say, I worked for you. Ultimately, you were my boss from the time I knew about it until my dying breath. No matter what I did, I was trying to do it for your glory. Yeah, I messed up a lot. No, I wasn't perfect. There were a lot of things I left undone. Some things because I was seeking your kingdom. I didn't get as far in my career as I really wanted to. Some of my coworkers didn't like me as much as they probably could have. But all of that I count as loss because ultimately it didn't glorify you, Jesus. But until that day, as we work, you get to experience the joy of advancing His kingdom, of cultivating His garden, of restoring your area and worshiping Him well. You've been listening to Crosspoint Youth Ministry. For more information or to see how you can get involved, please visit crosspointbible.org. Thank you, and God bless.